Good morning. We are in the second chapter of Isaiah. Um, Sunday school starts this week. Be here at 9.30. If uh, you attend the Pairs and Spares class, uh, you may hear all this again. Be a little bit different. But in any event, today we are talking about Isaiah chapter 2. Last week we really ended on a downer because the end of the first chapter of Isaiah was about the unfaithfulness of Jerusalem and of Judea, and it um, was just a downer. I mean, anytime discipline is involved, it, it's not pleasant. But today begins a, an interesting concept that I don't think even Isaiah, as he presented it to the people, could possibly have understood. Isaiah chapter 2, uh, my, my Bible says the Lord's future reign. That sounds really positive. This is a, a new section, and in it, Isaiah promises a future kingdom for the nation of Israel, for the Hebrew people. Um, he also promises a future period of reckoning. So we go back to that, the, that consequences idea of having um, actions, consequences, and, and the results that come from that. This is written during the time of King Jotham's uh, reign. And so let's just begin reading. Chapter 2, this is a vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, again, the, the southern kingdom. And before we can even get into it real good, he says, in the last days. Well, what does that mean, in the last days? Well, I have two ideas about that. I think when Isaiah, or one of the prophets said in the last days, they were thinking in the last days before the final period of the world, in the last days, the, the end of everything. But to us, the latter days, I think, refers to the ending of time that comes between Christ's first coming until his second coming. And I want you to go back and read with me 2 Timothy chapter 3. I've got it marked. I was better off if I didn't mark it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You should know this. Of course, this is Paul talking to Timothy. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, now this is, this is the time after Christ has come, been crucified and resurrected, and this is the beginning of the church age. He said that in the last days, there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Do I need to read that again? They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. In the last days, to us, those latter days are the time before Christ comes and gets us. Um, to the prophet, the days when God fulfills all of his promises toward Israel 
and brings their judgment to an end. That's Isaiah's meaning, I think, when he says this. And so, here we go. In the last days, if, I, if we're looking at this from Isaiah's perspective, we're looking at it from, from the time before Jerusalem and Judah gain the power that they believe they will have in being God's chosen people and God's chosen nation. So it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. Can you imagine? He envisions the mountains of the house of the Lord of Jerusalem being the chief mountains, superior to all the nations of the world. And they will come, people will come from all over the world to learn and to follow his ways. Uh, chapter 3, people from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of Jacob's God. For there he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths certain of the superiority, the, the preference of God's ways above all others. Um, for the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion, which is another name for Israel, and his word will go out from Jerusalem. Verse 4, the Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. Can you imagine believing and knowing that the Lord's judgment will lead to peaceful resolutions in all conflicts between all nations? Now, I want you... This, this, is the, this is the word of God given to Isaiah to give to the people. Right. I want to contrast verse 3. Let's read the whole thing. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion... His word will go out from Jerusalem. I want to compare that to verse 6. Because beginning in verse 5, we have again that judgment that has to come upon Judea and Jerusalem because of their disobedience. The discipline that is going to be required of them. Verse 6, for the Lord has rejected his people the descendants of Jacob, because they have filled their land with practices from the east and with sorcerers as the Philistines do. They have made alliances with pagans. Israel, in going out and becoming a nation of international strength, and power instead of just giving what they know about their God and sharing that knowledge with other nations they have instead allowed their nation they've brought back all of the things that they've seen in these pagan nations these non-believing nations and they've allowed that to fill their nation and, and he specifically names false religion, the occult. Um, in verse 7, he talks about the dependence on foreign wealth. Wow, Israel is full of silver and gold. There's no end to its treasures. Their land is full of war, war horses. There's no end to its chariots. They are dependent 
Their, their economy, are you listening to me? Their economy is built on foreign wealth. Um, you can see side by side the United States and, and Judea at this time. But we're not talking about the United States right now. We're talking about Judea. Um, verse 8. Their land is full of idols. The people worship things they have made with their own hands. And you know, when we think about that, we think about um, statues. Or, but it's not just statues, it's things. It's anything that makes us not have room for the Lord. It's anything that removes us and our activities and our actions from serving God and putting Him first. Um, in verse 7 when it talks about the war horses, um, horses were a, a sign of military strength. Um, the, the cavalry, the, the ability to move quickly, all of those things are signs of military power. And so, verse 8 again, their land is full of idols. The people worship things they've made with their own hands. Their homes, their, their jobs, their careers, anything that comes between us and God. And verse 9 really puts it all together. So now they will be humbled and all will be brought low. Do not forgive them. The word for humble is to bow down. Um, they will be bowed before the power of God, the avenging hand of God. Um, I, I, I did a little history, just a little history today, I promise. Uh, there was a port, Elath, E-L-A-T-H, near Tarshish, and it became a major major um, port for trade and it brought in riches and luxury beyond anything the Israelites had seen before. Uh, it was under constant, constant conflict and eventually was lost during the kingship of Ahaz. But um, the coming humbling of the crowd involves no forgiveness from God until all of his wrath, all of his anger is used up. That's really kind of scary. Um, and so now is probably a good time to, to bring in um, an idea of the covenant the reminder of covenant, the covenant that God made with, with the Israelites. And I, I stole this. I didn't come up with it. Um, if you're interested in reading the book, I got this from uh, Call Me and I'll let you know. Um, when, when our scripture begins, we learn about a, um, a love, a faith that God develops throughout this is these Hebrew people. And the first is, is Noah. Noah had faith when nobody else did. Noah did the right thing when no one else did. And God made this covenant really with one man, Noah and his family. And then there was the man of Abraham who had great faith, who is the father of of the nation, but God made a covenant with Abraham and his family. So, so we develop from this idea of an individual to a family and then the rescue from um, slavery by Moses and, and the idea of the nation of Israel as they move out from Egypt and of course united under King David. So Isaiah falls in this category. 
Isaiah will foretell the story of Messiah and the covenant that, that is made, including the Gentiles and the Hebrews. But this, this scripture, I don't want to say knows nothing, God knows everything, but, but the church age, as, as Isaiah says this, they're not even really thinking about it yet. So part of that goes into their last, their latter days come here. Our, our latter days come after Jesus. Um, I say that because the covenant that God made with all of his people said that I'll always be your God. And remember last week we talked about those two words, if and through. It's not unconditional. It's a conditional covenant. You obey me. If you do this, then this covenant remains. You don't know, uphold your end of the bargain. You're not part of that remnant. It's going to be forever. Um, the nation will exist. His chosen people will continue to exist. Um, but the nation that deserves punishment will receive it and purification and individuals will be faithful. Uh, gosh, we're not going to get done. Isaiah is introducing both a time of redemption and a time of judgment. We would refer to that. We see this. We read this and we see the, the Messianic kingdom um, and we see the tribulation. We see far beyond. We we can see beyond what Isaiah even knew that he was talking about. Um, gosh, I don't. I need to end this because I don't. Um, I don't want to run out of time. And there are too many points to make. Let me let me read something to you that um, that I read this week, and it. It has helped me to understand. I mean, I know that when I punished my children, I punished my children, uh, disciplined my children in hopes that they would become better individuals. Um, and so let me read this. God is not acting against his people. Um, he's allowing others to act against them. Consequences are consequences resulting from an enemy nation. He is using non-godly nations to discipline the nation that is supposed to be godly. How many times does he use the poor or the um, to confound the rich? Uh, the dumb people to confound the smart. I mean, God uses the people that we don't expect to use. Knowing the consequences doesn't prevent them from redefining or rationalizing their own idea of the Ten Commandments. So, so they're living their lives and it doesn't seem, because they've rationalized for so long, it doesn't feel to them like they're disobeying anything. Um, the judgment of God is to bring the pride of Israel so low that God is lifted up. And I want to read very quickly um, Revelation chapter 6. Verse 12 through 17, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree, shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone... The kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person 
all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of God. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive? We will learn that next week, starting I think in verse uh, 10 of chapter 2. The fate of the wicked, the joy of the redeemed. Thanks.